All right. Now, let's get my drink down here. This morning, I preached on judging righteous judgment, and um, there's a lot of people that that have a mixed up idea of, of you know being able to judge it all, and they have this judge not attitude. I went over all that this morning. Um, so I'm not going to re-preach that this evening, but one thing I do want to mention, and one thing that's very important, is, is not just understanding that, oh, well, I see Jesus judge, you know, that's kind of where I finished off this morning, Jesus judge, John the Baptist judge, you know, we see all these judgments that people made, and we're told to judge righteous judgment, not judge according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment, we're told these things, but... I want to go a little bit further because I don't want people just to be thinking, oh, well, it's okay to judge and then just have a bad attitude or a spirit about how you judge people and get real callous and cold and, and go about ha ultimately having an unrighteous judgment because you're not doing it properly. So what I want to focus on tonight is a little bit more on, on how and why we judge. There's, there's intended purposes for judging. And we started off tonight in Isaiah chapter 65 because Isaiah 65 in, in the beginning of the passage talks about a people that have a holier than thou attitude. So have you ever heard people say, oh, you're holier than thou? That phrase literally comes from the King James Bible. It comes from God's word. This is something that people use. And it's obviously a negative term. And it's a negative term to us too. It's not something that you want to be known as as someone who's holier than thou, meaning, oh, I'm so much more holy than you. That in itself, that term just exudes a pride of yourself and how great you are and how wicked and evil and sinful and, you know, everyone else is or, you, you know, the person that you're speaking to is. And that is not, that is not the attitude or the spirit that we ought to have when we do judge righteously. When we do say, thus saith the Lord, when we do say, hey, this is wicked, when, you do, when John the Baptist did say, hey, Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It's not a holier than thou attitude of preaching God's word. There is intended results and there are things, you know, in, in many different scenarios, we're going to get into that too, on, on how we judge and the way that we go about it because it's not a one size fits all either. There is not just one way to, as it were, execute judgment. And when I say execute judgment, I don't mean like carrying forth a sentence. I just mean the way that you speak a judgment, the way that you judge, right? There's different ways that you deal with people and treat people. But one way we don't want to have, and we're going to go through many, a few examples of this. And I just want you to notice, too, that when we go through these examples, these are all examples of, of unsaved people. The unsaved, false prophets, the Pharisees, they had this type of an attitude. And the people that we read about in Isaiah 65, we're going to start reading again in verse number one, they also, I believe these people are not saved, and they had a proud, lifted up attitude that they would be judging other people, even though they themselves were wicked. They were hypocrites, as we saw in Matthew 7 this morning. You know, judge not lest ye be judged. And it's, talking, it's referring to you know, like hypocrisy and you doing the same things when you judge other people. We see the same exact thing taking place. And it's really interesting because the people who are guilty of the hypocrisy are typically the ones that will have the holier-than-thou attitude. And it's funny, you know, I'm... I'm I wasn't intending on doing this, but like lately the, uh, the potter's house has just been kind of my whipping boy in general on, on some of my sermons because, they, you know, that church really is so destructive up here. And I preach a lot. I preach a couple of sermons just kind of dedicated to what they're doing. And um, of all the people I run across out soul winning, the, the people that go to that church have a tendency to be, have this pharisaical type, type of attitude in general. That's just, just the majority. And the reason being is because they're trusting in their works for their salvation. And when you're trusting in your works and you actually think that you're good, now look, they'll say, oh no, we believe it's grace. Yeah, they'll say that, but they don't believe it. Right. And, and I don't care what they say on paper. I don't care what, you know, I talk to these people on a regular basis. I go out soul winning twice a week 
every week and I run into people that go to the church. It's a big enough church. There's a lot of people that go there. And the vast majority, not every single sole person, but the vast majority of the people that go there will have a proud attitude. And they'll have a pharisaical attitude of them being better than everyone else because of all their works and how holy they are. And they have this holier than thou attitude because they're prideful and they're trusting in their works. That's what's keeping them safe. Oh, I'm not backsliding. Backsliders go to hell. I'm not backsliding because I'm doing all this good stuff. And if they really measured up themselves against the Bible, they'd realize they're wicked sinners. Short. They all, we all fall short. That's right. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one makes it there. And that's why you can't have this type of an attitude. Because we need to remember that and say humble. But let's look at this passage here. Uh, Isaiah 65, verse number one. The Bible says, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people, so this is describing now the people. He's saying, look, I've held out my hands all day to rebellious people. I'm trying to do good to them. I'm trying to show them the truth, but they're rebellious and they're refusing. And now he's going to get into, excuse me, some of the um, characteristics of this people. Verse number three, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. So they're not listening the way that God told them to do things. They're doing things their own way. They're, you know, making the groves. They're making the idols. They're, they're offering up their, their sacrifices the way that they want to do it instead of the way that God said to do it. Verse number four, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh. And remember, that was one of the, the dietary restrictions of the Old Testament that they weren't supposed to do. So they're, they're doing all these things. They're breaking these commandments. And it says, in broth of abominable things is in their vessels. Verse number, verse number five, which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. That was their attitude. Oh, oh, oh. Don't, don't you come near to me, right? Because don't you know, I'm holier than you are. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all of it. This is the way that God views says, you know, this is like a smoke. You know, I love the smell of a campfire, but you know what I don't like? I wouldn't like that smoke just in my nose all the time. That would be really annoying and, and just, I mean, making it, you know, it's, it's not good for you. And this is, you know, this is that type of, and he's saying, you know what? This is just a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. It's just always, I'm always getting this stink, this stench in my nose from their attitude and having this holier than thou attitude. Turn if you would to um, I want to go a little bit out of order in my notes. Turn if you would to Luke chapter 7. Yeah, Luke chapter 7. Because Luke chapter 7, the, one of the Pharisees that Jesus sat down with, ties in perfectly with the people that were being mentioned in Isaiah 65. Because remember, what did he say? Oh, stand by, come not near to me. Don't even get close to me because I'm more holy than you. I'm holier than now. This mentality, this attitude of these wicked people in Isaiah 65 carried forward all the way up to Jesus' day. And you know what? It carries forward even today by these false prophets, by the people who are trusting in their works for their salvation. Nine times out of ten are going to have this type of an attitude, holier than now. Well, you have to. If you think that your merits are going to get you to heaven, you're, you're think, you, you, there's no way they're going to think that they're sinners or that they're ungodly at all in any way. If that's what they're trusting in. Look at Luke 7, verse number 36. Verse number 36, Luke 7, the Bible says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. So he's what is he doing? He's judging within himself, right? 
He's making a judgment call about Jesus Christ because this sinner woman comes in and is at his feet and is wiping the, his feet with her tears and her hair and, and has this ointment and she's, you know, she's, she's attending to him that way. And this is what he said within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Is that not the whole, don't come near to me because I'm holier than thou. Don't even touch, oh, oh, if he were a prophet, he wouldn't even let her touch him. Because, you know, a prophet's holy. And if, you know, basically, what is he saying? That Jesus isn't holy and not a prophet because he's allowing a sinner to come to his feet and, and wash his feet with her hair. Talk about humility. I mean, someone that's willing to just get at the feet of, of God incarnate, of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and, and just humble herself so much to just, to just, I mean, imagine washing someone's feet with your own hair. Now, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to do that. I just think of, you know, rubbing someone's foot on top of my fuzzy head. But seriously, that's, 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 um, it's pretty low, right? It's, it's, you're bringing yourself very low to do something like that. And this woman did. And he explains to her, you know, like he knows his thoughts. And he rebukes him. This guy's judging Jesus for not being holier than now because that's the attitude that the Pharisees had. And Jesus is like, look, you know, he, he brings up the example of someone who's forgiven of a lot of sins or someone who's forgiven of a little. He's saying, hey, those are forgiven of a lot, love a lot. They're going to have a lot of love. This woman whose sins are, yeah, she has a lot of sin. But you know what? Her sins are forgiven and yours aren't. He's like, when I came into your house, you didn't offer what you didn't, you didn't give me anything. You didn't do anything for me as your guest. But this woman, since I came in, he says, she's wiping my feet with her hair, with her tears. She, she sinned a lot, but you know what? She's forgiven and she loves a lot. And that's what he explains to her. You know, that's, that is the proper attitude. And he, and he corrected the Pharisee appropriately. He judged him. And, and, and did it in a way where he didn't back down at all. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We're just going to see a couple more examples of this holier-than-thou attitude because this is the attitude we don't want to have, right? You don't want to think that you're so great and you're so holy that, you know, you go out soul winning or something, you don't want someone, oh, that dirty person touched you. Oh, I can't believe they touched me. Don't have that attitude, okay? Especially when people want to hear the word and they're coming, you know, they're not trying to punch you in the face. They're, they're you know, they're, 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 they're genuine and sincere and, you know, they, they, you know, yeah, but you're wearing your suit. So what? Who cares, right? That, that, let's not think that you're so holy that you can't be touched by these low people. Mark chapter 7, verse number 1, the Bible says, Then came together unto him, the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold as a washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So what are they doing? They're judging someone. They're judging the disciples. And what are they judging them on? Something that's not even in God's law. Something that doesn't even matter. Now, we, in our culture, in our society, is it normal to be washing your hands? Is it a good idea to wash your hands before you eat? Sure it is. It's not that the washing of the hand was a bad thing. That, that, that's not, you know, that's why they weren't doing it is because, oh, they're trying to, it wasn't an issue at all. They were hungry and wanted to eat. And I'll tell you what, you know what, sometimes when I'm hungry and I'm working all day and I'm doing stuff and I want to eat, I'll pick up my food and I'll eat it. That's right. <laughs> and, in, and you know what, I think about this story <laughs> because if Jesus says it's okay and he wasn't forbidding his disciples to do it, then great, yeah. right? Now, I still do think, you know, I make my children wash their hands. They go out to the gym place or whatever, playgrounds and stuff. Yeah, wash your hands. It's just a good idea to do. But you know what it's not? It's not scripture. 
except in this story, <laughs> where it's telling you that it's not God's commandment to do this. But what did the Pharisees do? They held up their own laws above the laws of God, or at least on the same playing field. And it's like, that's their tradition instead of what God actually said. And they're trying to apply their tradition as if it's gospel. Now look at verse number six. He answered and said unto them, well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. So again, what's their, their, their problem? Hypocrisy. They're lifted up with, pro with pride and they're hypocrites. Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Yeah, you speak the good, you know, these good words saying that, oh, we love the Lord. You know, we want to serve the Lord. We love the law of Moses, all this other stuff. But they're hypocrites. Why? Because they don't follow God's laws and they do follow their man-made laws. And they're just elevating these other man-made laws above the laws of God. Verse number seven, Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. Now, the re what I want to point out about this story, and turn if you would to uh, Luke chapter 18, I believe, Luke chapter 18, is what were they doing that was, th they were being hypocritical, one, because they weren't following God's laws and they were, they were establishing these other laws, but a, a way that people can get, you know, saved people can be unrighteously judging is in areas that are not like God's commands to do something. Okay, now, there are many things that I teach personally and I believe have biblical foundations or biblical principles but are not necessarily just commandments from God. And we need to be careful of this and remember this. For example, I think it's, it's, it's there are sound biblical principles to prove, to, to show that we ought to be eating as healthy as we can, right? To, to keep our bodies, which is the temple of the, whole, temple of the Holy Ghost, the best way we can keep our bodies. But people can get a little overboard on this. So I, I think it's a great thing to eat organic food. I think it's great to, you know, eat stuff that's healthy, you know, all this stuff. But be careful in your judgment of other people. You know what I don't do? I don't look down my nose at people who don't eat organically or who eat things that maybe I choose not to eat. Whatever, you know, that's their life between them. We don't need people now micromanaging and going and judging people for all of these smallest things and commandments of men that are not, you know, teaching for doctrines, the commandment of men. The doctrine is, you know, hey, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. And in the context, that's talking about fornication. Sinning against your body by committing fornication. We extrapolate, well, hey, if this is the temple, well, we ought to not ingest poisons, you know, the alcohol and this, the tobacco, you know, the nicotine, all these other things. Of course not. It's not good for us. We want to be good servants. We want to be healthy. We want to be used by God to the maximum. But don't go now and take that and just start judging people and giving people a hard time for, for doing things that you don't do. They don't do things exactly the way that you do them. Okay, that is not appropriate. That is not righteous judgment. And it, the same way it wasn't righteous judgment for the fair, you know, like I said, even the washing of hands. Is it a good idea? Sure it is. But should you be judging people over that? No. It's not your place to judge. And one of the things we can learn is that, you know, when, when understanding righteous, ju judging righteous judgment is when is it appropriate? There are some times when it is very appropriate, when someone is overtaken with a fault, and we'll get to that verse in a little bit, and, and, there's, a and there's a problem going on in their life. But there's other areas where it's just like, okay, let them deal with that. You're kind of getting, stepping over your bounds. Another, another example, is like, imagine a husband and wife just having some kind of disagreement, right? And you decide to step in and, and referee and say who's right and who's wrong. It's none of your business. Don't judge. Even if you're right on who's right, it doesn't matter. Stay out of it. That's their business. Now, if it's some other major sin problem that like a brother in Christ is married and you could see why they're having problems with their spouse, 
because of some serious thing that they have going on in their life, that's a different story. You, you know, you're going to try to help them. But, you know, there, there's so many, there is, and I could go on and on with different examples, but we need to just keep these things in mind. Are you in Luke chapter 18? We're going to see one more example here of like a pharisaical, holier than thou type of attitude that we don't want to have. Look at verse number nine. The Bible says, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. See, th it's that same theme. They trust in themselves. They're trusting in their own works. They're lifted up with pride and they think that they're righteous. So now they have this holier than thou attitude. Verse number 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, right? So he's praying with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. So what's he doing? He's praying to God. He's saying, God, I, th I thank you that I don't do these things, that I'm not this wicked person, and I'm not even like this guy, right? I mean, his neighbor, talk about your neighbor, right? This guy's right next to him going to pray, and he's like, I thank you that I'm not this guy. What type of a pompous attitude is that? <laughs> and this is real. Look, people have these types of attitudes, and we need to be aware. We don't want to fall into to have this type of a bad attitude because you think you're so holy. You think you're so righteous. And you know what? Praise God if you are getting sin out of your life and you're living more righteously and you're doing good things, but don't ever let that get you to the point to where you're just looking down on people. One, never forget where you came from. If you are doing better, great. But I got news for you. You're still a sinner. And you don't look at other people as pieces of trash. You look at them as people as, if they do have a lot of problems, hey, I'd like to help that person and say, well, thank God I'm not that person. Because you know what? In this story, and we're going to see this, this person is the outward, their inside is, their, is the other person's outside. And even worse. And the other person's inside is much better than, than their outward appearance because of their humility, because of their faith in God. Look at verse number um, 12. I fast twice in the week. So he's, now he's listing off how great he is. How, how, oh, what a great person. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And isn't it interesting? Like, it's, it always comes down to like, how much they give. Oh, my tithes. You know, the Potter's House Church, they're always talking about the tithe. They're always talking about the money. And, oh, man, you don't tithe, you're going to hell. And, it's, you know, they focus on that so much. Just like the Pharisees did. It's all about the money for them. Oh, look what I do. Oh, I tithe so much. And, look, this is coming from someone who believes in tithing. But this is not something that you need to be lifting yourself up about because you're not robbing from God. Like, give tithes of all you, but yeah, good for you. You're doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Verse number 13, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. See, the one guy goes up to God saying how great he is and how glad he is. He's not wicked like these other people. And the other guy's just like, God, I know I'm wicked. Just, just please have mercy on me. And look how, look how God deals with these two people. Verse number 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. This man being the latter, the guy who just said, be merciful to me, a sinner. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. These are the examples I wanted to turn to now. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter number 6. I had some more notes I actually have from this morning. I didn't get to, but it's fine because it actually uh, ties in with tonight's sermon. One thing we can learn from Luke 18, there of the two people, we need to stop comparing yourself against other people and compare yourself to God's word. Because that's what one of the things that this guy's problem was, is that he's looking around saying, oh, I'm better than this person, better than that person. No. Why don't you compare yourself to the, to the standard of God's, script, of, of God's word? And then maybe that'll help to keep you humble to say, wow, you know, I, I don't have any room to stand here. 
I don't have any place to just be condemning other people um, to this to, to this guy's because I think I'm so great. Um, now, when we go to when when you do make judgments, right? When when you make a righteous judgment, those that are wicked, they're always going to hate righteous judgment. Now, when I talk about the wicked, I'm actually referring to what the Bible calls like the wicked person in the book of Proverbs. People who are just like God haters, really evil people, really wicked people. No matter what, no matter how you go about, you know, stating righteous judgment, they'll always have a problem with it. And I've got a couple examples for you. Stay in Galatians 6 because that's going to be the right pattern. But if you remember like in Genesis 19 with, with Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Lot said to them, he says, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. So what was he doing to the Sodomites? He was judging them, right? Because he said what they were going to do was wicked. Oh, I can't believe Lot would judge. He shouldn't have said anything as they're about to rape these angels that, that were coming in to, to, to lodge with them. And then in verse number nine, when they answer him, they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge, Right? The Sodomites are always the ones saying, oh, who are you to judge? Oh, you're going to be a judge? Oh, you just came in here to stay with us, and now you're going to be our judge? The wicked don't like to hear that. They hate that. And, and here's their response then. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? Oh, you're going to judge? Well, guess what? Now we're going to do even worse things to you. That's the wicked people that hate God's judgment. They, hate, they never want to hear it. And they're going to come back even stronger. The Sodomites are wicked people. In, um, in Exodus, the story of Moses, it's the same type of an attitude where the wicked person says, well, who made you a judge? Well, who do you think you are to judge? In Exodus 2.13, the Bible says, and when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. They were fighting. And he said to him that did the wrong, so he's talking to the guy in the wrong. Moses made the judgment. He sees, hey, this guy's wrong. Wherefore smitest thou that fellow? Why are you hitting him? And he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. And um, when this story is recounted in Acts chapter 7, basically um, Philip says, you know, or Stephen, excuse me, Stephen said, um, God made him a judge. You know, the, the, when they said, who made you a judge or ruler over us? Well, God made him a judge. And he was a righteous judgment. But the wicked will say, oh, yeah, who are you? Who made you a judge? And then Stephen goes on to basically say that you're the children of your fathers. They rejected the prophets. They rejected Moses. And you rejected Jesus Christ. And then he ends up getting stoned as a result of that. Now, um, you're in Galatians chapter 6. So no matter what you do, when it comes to righteous judgment, there are some people that will get offended no matter what. And I just want to, you know, we just need to be aware of that. So... What I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the sermon this evening is not just to be walking on eggshells in when you do righteous judgment. Because that's not what the Bible teaches, is just walking on eggshells around people. We need to be able to just say the truth. But there is tact that you can use, and there are different situations that you get in when you do um, express judgment on, on whatever particular issue we're talking about. So the, the number one thing I want to focus on is not being proud. And we'll see that in Galatians chapter 6 in verse number 1 because pride was the common denominator in all the stories of the Pharisees and everyone had that holier-than-thou attitude. They were lifted up with pride. So one of the ways that we can help our judgment be a righteous judgment is... One, obviously, has to come from God's word, but two, the way that we um, approach somebody when we're trying to help them. Galatians 6, 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So he says here, and turn if you go to Philippians chapter 2, this is if someone's overtaken in a fault. Now, what is the purpose for the judgment in this case? If a brother or someone that you know is overtaken in a fault. So is this someone that needs to be rebuked because they sinned against you? No. 
they're overtaken in their own sin. They have their own problems. This is someone that, you know, maybe has a moat in their eye or maybe has a beam in their eye, right? Someone who's over, it's, it's not a moat. If they're overtaken in a fault, they've got a serious problem. And when you have people, and I taught on this not long ago when we went through the book of Galatians, but when, when you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, church members, people that you love, you, don't want, you shouldn't want them to just get backslidden and get involved in sin. And if you know that people are, are getting into things that they ought not to be getting into, the right thing to do is to, is to bring it up. If you care about that person, bring it up. But there's a right way to do it. And there's a wrong way to do it. And in this situation where you know someone's having problems with some type of sin and they're overtaken in a fault, it's not like they did something one time and you're going to go breathe down their neck about how bad that was that they did. Oh, I can't believe you did whatever, you know. But when they're being overtaken in a fault, it says you which are spiritual, right? Someone who doesn't have a beam sticking out of their eye. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. So don't go with a proud, pompous attitude. Be humble about it, but still tell them about it. And he says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You don't want to get involved in the same sin they're involved with, but use a spirit of meekness, humility, when you go and approach them because your goal is restoration of that person, that you can help them get right with God. Philippians chapter 2 is going to give us another um, aspect or characteristic of the attitude that we ought to have in this type of situation when we're trying to help people. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 2, the Bible reads, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And having that, hum that humble servant type attitude to help other people out is the way that you approach people. Where you could, I mean, it's, it's never a pleasant thing to bring up things that people don't probably want to talk about, like their sin. But you, ha you have to be forthcoming, but you do it in a way to where you're not starting a fight or an argument with them. You're, you're humbly approaching them and saying, look, you know, I, I've noticed some things and, you know, I just, I want to be a help to you. And I think that this is, you know, what's going on in your life is going to cause you a lot of problems. Can I just, just, you know, here's what God's word says. You know, I love you. I want you to do better. I, you know, but, but I've noticed this and, and I, I feel like I got to tell you this. And not everyone's going to accept that, but that's way different than approaching someone and just starting to rail on them right off the bat when it really has nothing to do with you anyways. It's just their own problem, right? So this is a certain type of scenario where this is the best way to approach someone like that. A brother in Christ, they're, you know, they're having a problem. Be lowly, be humble, and, and esteem them better than yourselves. Care about them enough to tell them where you think they can be uh, use some help. Now, there are different ways to judge for different scenarios. For example, when you go to church and you hear sin being preached against, that's judgment, right? That's judgment from God's word. And when you, usually it's pretty serious sins that you're going to be hearing coming across the pulpit and you're going to be hearing yelling and screaming and, and just, just proclaiming how wicked things are. That is also a righteous judgment. Like I said, it's not just you have to walk around on eggshells. But the way that messages are delivered can be changed depending on the situation and what's going on. Preaching, for example, Isaiah 58, 1 says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. That's another judgment where the preaching is saying, Hey, you know, listen up. This is wicked. This is wrong. You got to stop doing that. And you just kind of need a swift kick in the pants to help you get over something in your life. In 2 Timothy 4, 2, the Bible says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And that was advice to Timothy as a preacher on how to preach. Turn, if you would, to uh, Titus chapter 1. We're almost done. Titus chapter 1, Proverbs 25. See, here's another situation that you might find yourself in that, that needs judgment. 
is if you're dealing with someone that is actually doing something they shouldn't be doing in your presence, like backbiting. Like when people are talking bad about other people, there is a way to judge that person in a way that the Bible explains how to do it. And that is not quite as meek of a way to stop that sin. You need to be a little bit more bold to do what the Bible says. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, 23, the north wind driveth away the rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. So the Bible's saying when, when you're in the presence of someone's backbiting and they want to backbite against someone else to you, your proper response and the proper judgment when someone's saying those things is to give them a nasty look. Make, make sure it is known by the expression of your countenance of your face that they know I'm not agreeing with you and I actually don't like what you're saying. And it doesn't mean that that's the only thing you do. You can also tell them, right? You speak up and say, hey, you shouldn't be backbiting about people like that. And you could be a little bit more forceful when you're in the presence of the sin and you want to stop that from happening and you don't want to be a partaker of other people's sins. Because I'll tell you what, even though you may not be doing the backbiting, if you're, in, if you're in company of someone who starts backbiting about other people at church and you just listen to it and you sit there and you don't express any um, problems with it at all, you are now being partakers and emboldening them and giving them confidence that, hey, they didn't disagree with me, so they must agree with me. Silence is agreement, and you need to just make sure that you are not going to make it, you know, that you are making it well known that you, that you do not approve of the things that they're saying. And you know what that's going to do? That's going to help that person. Backbiting is a sin. God hates it. And he doesn't want people in church, especially, you know, causing divisions and sowing discord and backbiting against people. And we need to be very careful when we're in, in you know, whoever's company that, that we follow the Bible's way of judging. And yes, it's appropriate to judge when people are sinning like that and backbiting. Titus 1, verse number 12. The Bible says, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. So now we're going to see an instance where judgment is going to take place on a prophet, right? A false prophet. Because this is different than a brother who's overtaken in a fault. Now we're talking about false prophets making false accusations. And what were they saying? Because remember, Titus was an elder in Crete. He was a bishop. He had a church in Crete. So when it says the Cretans, it's talking about the people of Crete. The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. So it's just slanderous report of the people that live in Crete. And he says, this witness is true, meaning this false prophet really said this stuff. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. So those false prophets, they need a sharp rebuke. That is not the, the humble, gentle rebuke. But when you got a false prophet spewing out this wickedness, they need a sharp rebuke that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Galatians chapter 2, to turn if you would to, to 1 Corinthians 5, it's the last place we'll turn, we're almost done tonight, it's a little bit shorter of a sermon. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in Galatians chapter 2 we see an example of um, Paul standing up to Peter, right? Now they're, they're both godly men, right? Doing great works for the Lord, but Peter was in error and he was in error to the point to where he was leading other people astray with what he was doing. You know, it says, and the story goes that he was, you know, before the disciples came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles and everything was just fine and he was doing the, everything right. And then these other Judaizers come in and he breaks off his fellowship with the Gentiles basically and, and won't eat with them and is only eating with the Jews. And Paul has to withstand him to the face and tell him and rebuke him and say, no, you're wrong, Peter. What are you trying to do here? You're trying to bring them into bondage that, that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? I mean, we couldn't keep the law. Now you want them to keep the law too, you know, and all this stuff. In Galatians 2.11, it says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Paul called him out. Peter needed correction. And he did it appropriately. And he did it to his face. He didn't go around behind his back telling everyone all this stuff that Peter was doing wrong. He withstood him to his face. 
But he withstood him. He stood contrary. He didn't say, you know, and, I, and we don't know exactly, you know, the way the entire conversation went, but he rebuked him. It was a rebuke. It wasn't a, a pat on the back. It was judgment. And it was righteous judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's the last place we're going to look. The severity of the problem will determine how you go about with the proper judgment. Right? Like I said before, when someone's overtaken in their own sins, their own fault, and you could help them, and you could show them and say, hey, I don't think you should be doing this. This isn't good for you. You, you go very humbly, very meekly, and that, that type of spirit. But when you got people who are false prophets, you got other people that are, that are making bigger errors or bigger sins or leading more people astray or doing things like that, you, you need to use more sharpness. You need to be a little bit more bold or a little bit more sharp in the way that you respond and the way that you judge people. Now, judging against something like sodomy, sometimes, I mean, that needs to be shouted from the housetops because that is extremely wicked and it needs to be known this is not tolerated. There are some things that we do not tolerate at all. Right. And there is no, uh, you know, with, with, with other things, with some of the more minor things, yeah, you approach people a little bit more humbly, but there are some things where it's just like, nope, this is the way things are. There is no back down. There is no question whatsoever that this is wicked and that this is wrong. Amen. First Corinthians chapter five, and, and here's, here's an example it's not sodomy, but it's, it's really bad. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 1, look what the Bible says. It is reported commonly. So this is a common thing that's known in the church of Corinth, that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So he's saying, they're lifted up in pride. They've gotten haughty. They're getting this holier-than-thou attitude when their, own, when, when their own church members are just living in complete wickedness. I mean, this guy has his father's wife. And it's just no problem. Instead of he's saying, look, you need to be taken away. And he says in verse number three, for I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already. But I was like, I don't even have to be there to judge this situation. I know the right judgment. I don't have to hear all the sides. I've heard enough because it's reported commonly that this is going on. And, if, and I know this is going on and I know the judgment of that. This isn't some gray area that I really need to think about and study the scripture on and get back to you on. He says, I've judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, look at the judgment, verse number five, to deliver such an one unto Satan. For the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now the end result is still, you know, hey, I want the spirit to be saved. But the way, that the path of getting there is not a pleasant one. That judgment is, is, you can say, a harsh judgment. But it's necessary. It's required. And sometimes when there's something that serious going on, there needs to be some pretty serious judgment going on. And some pretty serious judging and not just... Oh, I don't, you know, we have a tendency to just not want to get involved with anybody's matters, no matter what. And I'm a big guy that just kind of, you know, live and let live, let other people do their stuff. But I'll tell you what, there's definitely times where, you know, it's right to get involved, especially within the church and, you know, among people that you love and just the church in general. I mean, you can't just allow this to come in. The Bible says in this chapter, you know, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. You just allow this wickedness to come in and just be accepted. I mean, what are the kids going to learn from that? What is anyone going to learn from that? What's a new believer going to learn from that? Just whatever goes, everything's tolerated, all welcome. Not in God's church. Right. Jump down to verse number 11. We're going to see here's the last place where we're going to see judgment happening within the church as it ought to. And here is a good dividing line of when things are more serious versus when things are not quite as serious. So you can get someone overtaken in a fault some error in their life where, man, yeah, they're going down the wrong path. I could see them doing things. It's just not really good for them. And they're in sin. But that's different than someone being in a situation like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 11. 
He says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So there are certain sins here that are laid out that he's saying, you know, if someone, if a, if someone who's a brother, not someone who just got saved, but someone who's called a brother, someone who's been in church for a while, they know right from wrong, they know what God's word says, and they're wrapped up in these sins of either being a fornicator or being covetous or being idolater, being a railer. He says, you know what? This is a dividing line. Don't even talk to that person. This is the judgment that's righteous. Don't even go out to eat. Have nothing to do with them. They just need to get out of here and get themselves right with God. And you know what? If they become repentant and come back, great. We'll accept them back in. We'll love them. It's, you know, we're not going to hold a grudge against them. But at the same time, we're going to put away from among ourselves that wicked person. And, and pay attention to this because there's a difference between sinning like everybody does and being a wicked person. If you're, if you're a drunkard, you're a wicked person, according to the Bible. And you know what? That, that, that's someone that could be overtaken, but if you know better, if you're a brother, if you've been, you know, you've been coming to church, you've been saved, and you get you know, involved in this stuff, I'm not going to go and, and eat meals with you. And you're not going to be welcome at church. We'll pray, I'll pray that you, you get right with God. But there are certain things that you can allow yourself to get into where the judgment, the proper just judgment, the righteous judgment from God is just to put away that wicked person. And you know what? Other sins aren't that way. This is why it's important. I, I don't have time to go through the entire Bible and we'll go through every single sin individually. But we use these principles, we use these scriptures to determine what's righteous and what's not. How do we go about doing this? When someone's overtaking a fall, hey, let's be humble, let's be meek with them. But when things get a little bit more serious, when there's bigger problems, you know what? Sometimes people need to rebuke sharply. And you're not quite as kind anymore. And you, you take off the gloves, as it were, to, to, to give the judgment. And we need to just study to show ourselves approved unto God and, and to know what's appropriate and to gain that proper discernment. But in no, in no case should we ever have a holier-than-thou attitude that just lifts ourselves up as being so great and bring other people down. Not associating with people that do, that, that do those sins and that listen in 1 Corinthians 5 is not lifting yourselves up. That's just saying, hey, that's extremely wicked and we're not going to have anything to do with that. But if you get right, we'll get back with, you know, we're, we're totally good to, to, to bring you back in and welcome you back and not hold it against you. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that we received from your word, God. We ask that you would please just um, help us to, to discern the right times to, to use good judgment, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please give us the wisdom that we need to do so. Pray that you please help us to have the right spirit when we, when we do um, pronounce a judgment or when we see an area where someone could use some help, Lord, and help us to be able to, to have the boldness as well to, to speak up and to say things that need to be said. Help us have the boldness, uh, especially in this wicked world, to just to, to voice uh, truth and, and to voice righteous judgment, dear Lord, and to not to be afraid and not to back down and not to let the, the, the bullying God-haters control the dialogue and control the direction of our country, dear Lord. Help those of us that love you and love your commandments to speak up boldly and to, and to just say, hey, no, thus saith the Lord, that's wickedness, that's sin, and people shouldn't be doing that and, that, and that we could maybe stem the tide and not allow everyone to get sucked into all the, the liberal nonsense of people just being tolerant of every form of wickedness, dear Lords. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.